All right. Hello. Um, my name is Alex, uh, Alex Blanco. So let's go to this slide. So this is a short version of uh, my presentation on um, you know, lesson, les lessons learned building microservices at scale. So first, quick introduction. So I'm um, a dev manager for the product called Application Insights. Uh, not sure how, may how many of you are familiar. Application Insights is an APM product. Uh, we are uh, monitoring services and websites and other applications uh, mostly for Azure, but not just for Azure. You can use our product for anywhere you run it, including not just not just in Azure. And uh, in quick word, in quick um, words, what application size is is uh, you take our SDKs, you onboard our your applications to our SDKs, you start sending us your telemetry. We aggregate telemetry, we process it, and then we are ready to visualize it for you um, in Azure Portal. So from that, we have your uh, APM curated experience. You have your analytics. So uh, lots of other companies are doing the same thing. You know, there was a, um, a, a speaker from Dynatrace. They're obviously doing the same thing. New Relic and others are doing very sim similar things. Um, all right. So that's what Application Insights is. And uh, Application Insights is a, in itself is a microservice. So why is it as a microservice? So we are. Um, there are key attributes of the microservice, and uh, my favorite definition is by Martin Fowler, which I omitted. There was a slide about this, which, which I excluded from this, and it basically gives the key attributes of a microservice that includes things like you know, decentralized governance, meaning you have your using right tool for the job, you have uh, one microservice written in one technology, another microservice written in another technology. You have your smart endpoints, and you have your dumb pipes, meaning the Individually, those microservices, they're smart, but the, um, the data um, that is, is traveling between is designed in such protocols that are not incorporate any of the business logic. So that's dumb endpoint, um, smart endpoints and dumb pipes. I mentioned decentralized um, uh, governance. There is also decentralized data management is another one. So specifically, this is a very, very simplified version of our pipeline. So you can see, you know, obviously it starts with SDKs, then uh, it goes to our ingestion service, and from ingestion service we process the data, we deposit it into Azure Event Hub, then we have loaders that um, take the data from Event Hubs and then load it into the stores. From the stores, now we query the data. So uh, you have here, is a, it's a microservice, right? So, you have, so we have services written in ASP.NET. Now increasingly we're starting to use services in Node.js. Individually, the services are separately deployable. They're separately maintained. We have separate um, teams supporting services. So that's another concept of your microservice architecture, right? You have your teams working on, working on um, products, not projects. So you have a team that's written the service. You ideally want the same team to maintain the service, because otherwise they wouldn't be writing the service with the support in mind. So that's, one of, again, one of the attributes of the microservice. Now, what I'm going to be talking about is like, so today, if you come to our daily life site triage every morning, it's very boring. It's very uneventful. We don't speak about pretty much nothing, nothing happens. We have occasional um, outages, but they're compared to where we were two and a half years ago. That's essentially nothing. It's, it's showing that we have time to discuss you know, safe deploy procedures. So we have time to, to discuss you know, engineers using secure, secure workstation machines. Now, and that where we were two years ago is that we, we had five to seven self one incidents daily. So you'd come in the morning to the triage, and actually people on call wouldn't be there because they would be probably you know, resting from the eventful night. And then people who are actually coming to work, they would take over from them. That's, that's where we were. And then how did we get from there? Um, yes. Oh, OK. All right. Um, OK, thanks. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to be talking about sort of starting from, and I'll sort of elaborate on this, What's the mental model to adopt? So the mental model to adopt is, first and foremost, is designed for failure. Now, I think it's a cliche at this point. Everyone knows this. But then it's, it's actually interesting how we forget when it comes to you know, the code we write that anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And it actually does happen that whatever you, if you, for instance, 
Sometimes there is a limit to everything. You cannot test for everything. But it's precisely for the thing that you don't test that will happen. Like if you don't test for your memory leaks after 10 days of heavy load, guess what? That's exactly what you're going to have. So be prepared to have that <laughs> your memory leaks after 10 days of heavy load. And then sometimes people also use this argument, but the possibilities are astro astronomical. But then just like actually traveling to this conference, I thought was a good example. And I took a very simple you know, service with 1K RPS. And then obviously that's, that's lots of, we have plenty and plenty of services like this. And already that is generating about 32 billion requests per year. Right? So that's your astronomical, it's not quite an astronomical number, but then considering that each request will result into how many you know, subsequent requests to the downline, downline services, it's easy to get to those astronomical numbers. Um, so planning and monitoring, then designed for resilience, designed for capacity optimization, designed for clarity. Let's go now over all of this. First, so when you, I believe that uh, monitoring is a science, it's not art. Now, diagnostics and then, you know, some clever things that, uh, you know, people do as engineers when investigate, that can be art. But when it comes to designing your monitoring, it's science. It should be boring, I think, right? So basically the way to approach it is that you have to think what is it that you are, what signals you're looking at? And it's latency, traffic, errors, and capacity. That's sort of common four things that we're, we're looking at. And I think all of them are clear. For capacity, what I mean for capacity is more, and other, sometimes they say situation, is like when you service, how, uh, how close is it to running on its capacity? So that determines how you configure your auto scale. So those are your four signals, right? Four types of signals. Now, when you design your uh, monitoring, you know, to, you want to take all those four signals and look at them from four aspects. So basically, what am I doing for alerting? What am I doing for triage, for diagnostics, for reporting, and for plumbing? And then there has to be an answer. So basically, you have to be able to take the grid, you know, those two-by-two two grid, and fill in the checkbox for each of those, or some say, sort of story. Like when you say, what's your story for alerting for errors? You've got to say, yes, and maybe it's a conscious decision that they say there is nothing there, but there's got to be an answer to this for every one of those cells in the grid. Um, let's skip over the roles in monitoring for the sake of time. Right, so uh, first, alerting, right? Alerting is uh, uh, the, the, common, the most common thing, and as we, you know, if you've been on an on a, on a organization planning a microservice, you know, you know what about, you know, you're probably familiar with alert fatigue. So with people being not being uh, disciplined about what types of things they're alerting for. So alerts, you know, are they urgent? Are they real? Are they actionable? And uh, there got to be this real sense of urgency. If we're waking someone in the middle of the night where there is, it's not urgent, so we're, we're doing basically, a, we're committing a, like a mini crime, right? <laughs> Say We're doing something that's, that's consequently going to bring the morale down, it's gonna, not going to be good for anyone. So there's got to be a sense of urgency. Um, another in, one is important is this, are we waking someone up for which there could be write, written an automation? So when I say about action alerts, we mean actionable for, in some, there is some intelligence requires from a human. If it can be automated, why isn't it? And it could be that we say, yes, it's on the backlog, we haven't automated, but we've got to be thinking about this. Um, Another one is important is, and actually I, uh, it's often that people tend to get in this kind of mindset is this, oh, I have this component and I will be alerting when it's down because it's important, right? Like it can, but what's important to understand that, that for something like alerting, we want to be alerting on symptoms. What it means is that the question to ask is, what's, what is it the impact on the users? Because users, frankly, they don't care about, uh, about the causes. What they care about is, about the symptoms. In the common, you know, like a good example, I think, is what if they, like, would you be alerting if your caching layer is down? Well, for most, the answer is yes, that's important, right? Like, but the, the actual users, they don't care if you have a caching layer. They don't actually care if you have a database or you have any types of storage. What they care about is are they getting failures or are their pages loading fast? Now, of course, you may say that, well, that's just going to be the next thing is my caching layer is down, so the query is going to slow down. But it's a totally different mindset. Now you say, you know, I'm alerting on my, on my queries being slow. Sure, that's, that's fair. But if you say, I'm alerting on this component being, being down on this, that's just a, the next question is, why can't it wait till the business hours for investigation? Why does it have to be an alert? 
Um, any questions so far on what we've discussed? We can go in fast. But. All right. Um, so I like this one, and it's, uh, I think it's a, it's a common one. So have you ever been in a situation, you're in a project, you know, imagine there is a front end, right? And the front end gets, starts getting alerts. So there is one front end component, there is another front end component, the third one. All of them are getting alerts. And now we have one DRI who is woken up in the night. Now we have second DRI. They all woken up and they're slowly starting to realize what's going on. Now all of them are realizing that it's actually the storage is the, is, is the reason. Now the storage DRI in the meantime, they haven't gotten anything yet. So they're, they're, you know, they're good. They're, they're, they're asleep in their bed. Uh, so there are two obviously things with this. So first of all, that um, what hasn't taken place here is uh, alert routing, but more importantly, alert consolidation. Like, so we've, we've done two things wrong here. So we haven't uh, automatically identified that the component to blame is actually the storage service. And the second thing, like why are we issuing three different alerts for the, which is really the same issue. So that's an example of the things I kind of described on the previous slide not implemented correctly, right? And then obviously that's the happy path where you have, you know, your smart detection automatically uh, identified that it's actually the storage that's, that's responsible. So we woke, we, we woke up the storage DRI and all the fronted DRIs, they're good, they're, they're, they're happy. All right. Um, so when you talk about monitoring, another sort of common approach and I'm talking all about this because that's how we started. When we started on the project, there were a lot of engineers who were never ran services before, mostly written client-side code. So for them, uh, sort of putting a whole bunch of data and starting to sort of uh, trying to get inspiration from looking at random charts and looking at that and looking at this was sort of a, a common way how we started until we realized, you know, we've got to have a structure about our, our monitoring. And... Uh, uh, First of all, it's, it's like you cannot simply collect everything. It's impossible. First of all, you're going to drown in data. You're going to incur storage and network costs. So all the monitoring data that you cannot collect, you have to limit it somehow. So then the conversation goes into what's the right way to implement sampling. And what's important for us um, here is that when you sample your data, you got to either include all the um, signals within the transaction or exclude everything within the transaction. Because if you're including only partial data within a tra transaction, it means that you can never be sure whether something has happened or something has never been basically sampled out. So it's very important that you have your transactional, when you have your transaction that go across multiple services, that you use some sort of common way of sampling them. Usually some, it's just some common key by which you identify that this should be included or excluded. Maybe some, and that's, so that's why if, we, if you see the transaction part is included for one service, it's also included for the other, not, uh, not the other way around. Um, any, any questions on this, on the, on the sampling? All right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I mean, I'm also probably the last thing standing between you and the keynote and then the happy hour, so I want to... All right. So, um, so this is kind of the last things that I discussed were on monitoring, kind of main monitoring things to take, uh, to, to consider. Now, let's go about designing and design for resilience. That's a, so how do we design for resilience? Obviously, there are a ton of resources on this. For me, I think the, the most important part is that, and that comes down to understanding, remember how we said, everything will go, everything that can go wrong will go wrong, so we remember this. And now we think about, given that we know already it's going to go wrong, so what are we doing about this? And that's where, you know, the graceful degradation comes in. So you gotta have, and you gotta understand that since things will go wrong, and since you have microservices, how do we go about this part, this microservice, or this particular area even of a, of a, of a service, going down? And that's where we think about, you know, common common example for something like a portal, a news portal. You have a specific. Imagine your weather widget cannot load because something is is down on a service that's that's serving the weather data. You don't want the whole thing to go down, right? You just want us to to have a way to gracefully degrade the experience for the portal. Um, another one is. Uh, you know, circuit breakers. Circuit breakers is a, is a very uh, useful pattern, is a pattern that, you know, commonly used, is that uh, circuit breaker is when you 
given enough errors flowing down a certain path, what you do is that while default um, state for circuit breaker is that it is, it is uh, closed, meaning uh, it's uh, allowing any calls to proceed, so circuit breaker is closed, and then imagine we have enough, enough failures happening, and then we circuit breaker goes into this open position. So open meaning it's not allowing any more calls to proceed. Now, why are we opening the circuit breaker? Why are we not allowing the failures to proceed? Well, what usually happens is that failure causes a lot of uh, effort for us on all the downline services to process this error. And usually, with enough retries, it can significantly impact our capacity. So that's why we need the circuit break. We need to say, stop, don't, don't send me any more data. I know that it's not working, so we're going to open the circuit breaker. Now, suppose enough time passed. Now we're ready to open it, but we're testing it first. So we say, OK, now our circuit breaker is half open, and we're allowing exactly next call to proceed. Say next call is successful, then we say, oh, we're good. We're going to go close the circuit breaker. Everything's good. Maybe it fails again. Oh, we go back to circuit breakers open. We're not allowing calls to proceed. So that's a common, that's a very uh, common pattern. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. But for us, it was a, it was a very useful thing to help uh, sort of control the situation, mitigate the when we know we have a problem with one of the services. What do we do about uh, protecting uh, the the, uh, the overall system? Um, so bulkheads. Bulkheads is another way of, essentially, bulkheads is this thing you have on a boat where, it, in case there is a leaky part of one of the boat, it doesn't, doesn't uh, sink the whole boat. So that's, that's your bulkheads, and that's where the word is coming from. In a services design, that's basically a way to, uh, to protect a part of the service where, when it's down, it's not um, affecting the rest of the service. Why would, it, why would it be the problem? So what happens is usually when... Suppose you have a service which is communicating to some downline service which is down. In that case, what's happening is that your calls are significantly delayed, and because the call is significantly delayed, maybe exceptions are throwing, it's affecting the overall resources for the service. So what you would do in this case, for example, is to set up a special um, thread pool just for this part of the service, or you set up a special... Um, uh, so thread pool is... Not, like, you S special heap for just for this part of the service. So you can exhaust this part of resources, that's fine, it's, we'll, we know it's not working, but it's not going to affect the rest of the service. So that's, the, that's your bulkheads. Injecting failure, so people probably familiar with like Netflix Chaos, Mon um, Chaos Monkey is a way to sort of randomly and purposefully trying to inject failure into your systems and trying to, uh, to test uh, how you would react to failures, how the whole uh, services the ho in the whole cluster sometime would react to uh, some unpredictable situations. So that's your, uh, so that's, that's all for, you know, talking in the scope of resilience. Uh, okay, before we go to the next one, any questions on resilience, uh, circuit breakers, uh, bulkheads, anything? Uh, all right. Um, so out of scale is now most of the uh, cloud hosting environments support out of scale. Out of scale, I think, is a godsend. It's, it's, it's saving us so much time that it's frankly, it's a, like I can't think how we lived without out of scale because what we were looking every day, we come to triage and we look, oh, which, which is this, uh, which machines are running hot? Oh, what do we do? Do we, like, I remember this and it's, it's now, it's, it's, it's uh, we've never been able to scale what we are now if we've been, you know, without out of scale. So I think um, we all understand kind of how the scale works. I think the critical thing for out of scale is, first of all, that you have to define the max number of overall machines in the pool because you want to keep your budget under control. So that's important. You don't want to just sort of, uh, you know, kill your budget because of out of scale. Um, and another one, you want to have a, initially when you deploy something and when, you know, there is a, something like a VIP swap happening, um, you want to make sure that the initial count is reasonable, so you don't spend the next sort of many hours trying to recover and then bring a, your service up to the uh, to the necessary number of instances. Because running under instanced is a is a problem. It, everyone, your users first of all is impact, are impacted, and it can be really dangerous. So you don't you want to run with a very good generous number of instances. Um, Okay, so this talks a little bit about what's the right way to configure how to increase your auto scale. I think we'll, we'll, that's, I, that's a basically a common formula, but we'll, we'll skip over this. Um, 
now. I think um, this one is interesting, and it's, in, it's, it's uh, so how do you design for you know, your geo distribution? And obviously, first and foremost, you want to optimize for your, best, for your best user experience. And what it means is that you want to have a proximity uh, to the, uh, f uh, you want to have proximity to the user. Now, as, the, as, a, as in the previous speaker, remember, remember we are always constrained by the speed of light, and sort of uh, kind of back on the envelope calculation just says that it's 40 milliseconds to go from Chicago to Beijing. Obviously, with multiple calls, it all translates into some minimal latency that is impossible to break unless you build your, uh, you, you bring your back end closer to where your front end is, or really until you, first of all, bring your front ends closer to the end user. So that's, that's very important. But then what happens is that uh, you, you shouldn't forget that by bringing all the front ends closer to the user, and if you still have just a single back end, guess who is paying for this? Well, you are, of course, right? Because you are, you are um, all this data that goes from front end to back end is, is what you have to pay for, because that's your network cost now. So it wasn't common for us to find out, oh, the most of what we're spending is actually on the network cost. And, and, and we realized then, well, actually, our users, in our case for application insights, users actually don't care about latency because it's, it's there as the case that are sending data. It's not on the experience critical path or anything like this. So then uh, for us, um, trying to build a sort of a combination of things for the services where the end user is interested in the latency, for those ones who want to bring the front ends closer, but for the other experiences, we want to actually be sending data uh, to the back end. So in this case, obviously, the users incurring the extra latency. Uh, but in this case, we're keeping our costs under control. So ultimately, all this translates into the user kind of value proposition. So any, any questions on, on, this, on, on, on this distinction? You know, bring services closer, user. And oh, all right. Um, for something that's uh, disruptive, it, you want to make sure that it's randomized. So have you ever wondered why IS Apple Recycle is set to 1740 minutes? So that's your smallest number of hours. It's a prime number over 24. So what it means is that you will never have enough of those happening at the same time because with the prime number going over, it's, it's, uh, you're essentially minimizing the possibility for them to, to, for this disruptive event to happen at the same time. So you got to be approaching everything with this, with the, with the not forgetting that everything that you put, everything you put in your code, will happen in this, in this, you know, humongous ma magnitude. So that's the reason. Also, randomness is built into the exponential retry algorithms. When something's retrying, you want to have this degree of randomness built in in the retry intervals, so you don't retry at the same time. Otherwise, you know, enough things retry and will generate so much load, you, it will bring the service down. So just remembering that anything disruptive has to have this, especially happening at intervals, intervals have to have this degree of randomness. Um, for, the, for caching design, I think the most important thing is, is uh, that you don't overcomplicate it. It's, obviously, it's the easiest way often to optimize performance and to optimize your costs, but if you overcomplicate caching, there is going to be no way you're going to debug it. It's going to be a nightmare trying to debug and understand all these layers of caching and reproduce the issues because it's obviously transient. So, try, so that's, that's, for us at least, keeping your caching model simple, that's the key to success, not, not uh, trying to, even at the expense of actually having less caching as long as it's simple. Um, and finally, I think this one um, to briefly talk about, it, it mainly talks about keeping your data flow. Uh, if you were to draw the picture of your architecture, you want to keep it ideally. The errors go in one direction. You don't want to have what happens is in this sort of uh, example is that you, you start with this clear architecture, but then you have, in some cases, your people, because there are multiple teams working, because there is no often, with a complex enough project, there is no central person reviewing the architecture for everything. You know, things happen as, they, as, as people trying to be agile, people trying to add calls here and there, and they are, you know, errors start going the other way. And at this point, you know, trying to understand which of the services has the root cause in a life site situation is, you know, good luck with that, basically. And it, 
especially if you don't have bulkheads protecting the areas of the service, you're going to have this mess where you won't even realize which service started the problem, but you're going to have everything essentially affected by, by the issue. Um, and the final one is when you have an incident, don't just leave it at this. Have this sort of five wise exercise because it's critical to uh, don't assign the blame to people. Assign always the blame to the process and try to get to the what can we be done about this? Not not the person, but the process. As, you know that's the uh, you know five wise exercise you can um, read in Wikipedia. That's a, we use it effectively for basically every big life site outage. We go through this five five wise exercise thing. All right, so to recap, these are kind of your things that uh, to, to take home is, you know, uh, uh, monitoring, design for resiliency, design for capacity, design for clarity. I think as far as the material, that's all I have. Anything, any questions on the summary slide or, yes, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would like to ask a question. Um, there was uh, Amazon failure uh, like six weeks ago, and uh, we've seen that many respected services uh, fell down. Uh, Netflix was working, but many, many other big, uh, big startups, unicorns, uh, they were not uh, available during that, that failure time. And these guys are generally knowledgeable. They are doing presentations on, uh, on the conferences like that. Yeah. They know about uh, Chaos Monkey. They know about resilience. They know about latency. So now, now what do you think are the main uh, two, three reasons why uh, these companies with uh, good engineering talent, uh, with uh, good financing, uh, were unable to, to build really uh, highly available system? In the case of uh, just a part of a region failed, it, it was it was not not even uh, the whole region uh, failed. So um, it's it's apparently an, uh, a very expensive expensive uh, issue to target. So what do you think is uh, are the, the most two three reason uh, reasons for that? Well, so the biggest reason is that of course it's very easy to come to the conference and talk about it. Like and it's like there is it's 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 easy. What's much harder to do is actually uh, first of all. Uh, I think, uh, first and foremost, it starts from the management. Is the management just doing the lip service to engineers, agreeing with all this, you know, setting up conferences, or are they actually willing to invest into putting this protective mechanism in place at the expense of having less features? Like when you come to your director and say, look, we're going to invest next half year building the resiliency, actually refactoring the service, so we have, uh, uh, we have proper way to diagnose uh, the issues, or but you won't get any of those new features. So how will this conversation go? And in most organizations, the conversation will go in a very predictable way. They will ask, they will try to s set up, because they are reasonable people, they try, try to set up some compromise. Let's just do a little bit here, let's just do a little bit here, but then we ultimately, so I think that's, that's what it comes down to. That it's, it's, we all understand this, it's very easy to talk about this, but it takes, you know, the willingness on the management side and the discipline on the kind of engineering leaders to, to, to actually go and implement those. Um, yeah, I actually read an, an article about the analysis of that failure, and uh, I think, uh, like many of the large failures like this, it came down to, you know, a, a sysadmin some, somewhere doing something wrong. Um, so they had, uh, you know, uh, huge engineering effort in making the systems re reliable, the hardware reliable, the networks reliable. Uh, but m uh, maybe one of these bullets you can add on here is assume that someone somewhere is going to F it up. Um, and to make sure that, that you can uh, identify that and recover from it. If an admin goes and drops the wrong table or pushes the wrong patch, that there are mechanisms to identify that that's happened and recover from that. Yeah. Um, because people uh, assume that the operators are going to be perfect, and that's not a great assumption uh, on, on this kind of scale. Yeah, that's, that, that's a good point. I think it comes down to also injecting the, f the failure purposefully to, to see if we can recover. On Accidentally on purpose, yeah. 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 Um, that's okay. Any other questions? Great session, Alex. Thank okay. you.